You can keep talking, but I'll, I'll share with you what I'm getting here so far. So here's some of the responses. Love one another. Obey the rules. Uh, lots of people listing love, that God loves you and never leaves. Jesus loves me and you. Um, I'm a beloved child of God. It's my way or the highway. <laughs> if you're not baptized, you're not going to be really saved. Loving selflessness, peace, and brotherhood. Be kind to one another, just as Ellen says. Oh, Ellen, on TV, all right. Jesus rose from the dead and will return one day. Somebody says, I'm not sure, I was a baby. Well, that's fine. <laughs> um, a, a Catholic response, obey. Someone got that from their Catholic background. Lots of um, expressions of love. Being saved. Um, so I just, I, I think this illustrates, and you keep sending me responses, they're very interesting, that we all start off very early on with this hermeneutic, with these lenses that color the experience we had. Why is it important to know that? Well, one reason is because that, those lenses not only color how we understand the life of faith, they understand how we live out the life of faith, or don't live it out, I suppose, as, as the case may be. Um, it's been suggested that the only people who think they don't have a hermeneutic are fundamentalists and literalists. And of course, they do have a hermeneutic. They just think they don't or they pretend that they don't. And in fact, from almost the beginning of this tradition that we call the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, the leaders of this movement said very early on that we reject fundamentalism and literalism partly for the reason that they said it was important to know the lenses through which you were seeing the life of faith. Know the lenses through which you read Scripture. That's why we don't all read Scripture the same way. And it's important to know it and to be able to name it so that I can share with you how I'm reading a piece of Scripture, you can share it with me, and we can learn from each other instead of pretending we all just agree. Knowing your hermeneutic keeps us from making statements like, well, the Bible clearly says, or Jesus clearly taught such and such, when we all know that if it was so clear, we wouldn't have been arguing about all this for the last 2,000 years, right? So let's take this piece of scripture that I put before you today. Let's, let's uh, consider how you look at it through your lens and how I'm looking at it through my lens. We have this text from the Gospel of Mark, which I'd suggest in some ways is Mark's hermeneutic. Whoever Mark was that wrote this Gospel, we get his hermeneutic every time we read his Gospel, and it might be a little bit different from the writers of the other Gospels. So he starts out this chapter telling the story about Jesus, who's had all these arguments, basically, these disagreements with some of the Jewish religious elite. They're bothered because they perceive that Jesus has been um, sort of oh, not bad-mouthing them, but critiquing them in public. And so they have decided they're going to try to trap him, maybe theologically get him in a trap. And because they don't agree with him theologically, they do not agree with the hermeneutic through which Jesus is trying to talk about the grace of God. They don't like the people Jesus has been hanging around with and eating with. They don't agree that he has any authority to be teaching people in public. In fact, they've even at one point, they accuse him of being possessed by a demon. So there's this scribe who's sort of been observing all of this and this disagreement between Jesus and the religious elite. And he goes to Jesus and asks him a question. And I believe the way I read the story is he honestly wants to be in dialogue with Jesus. He's not trying to trap him. He wants to understand what's your hermeneutic, basically. What lens are you seeing the good news through? And so he says to him, which commandment is the first one? Now notice he doesn't say which one is the most important because surely they're all important, but he says, what's the first one? And Jesus cheats and gives two responses. He says, all right, well, the, the important ones are to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now we know that he gets this verse, love God, he gets that out of Deuteronomy. And it's a part of the Bible that Jewish people call the Shema. And it encapsulates for them, basically, their hermeneutic, the basic teaching that all Jewish people should know. Many of them can repeat it by heart. But encapsulated in there is to love God. That's important. And then he goes to Leviticus and he quotes out of there, love your neighbor. And he tacks on as yourself. And so there's no new teaching here. Jesus is just pulling out of the tradition that's already there. In a sense, Jesus is saying these two things encapsulate all of the teachings that we need to present to people. This is, in essence, for Jesus, at least through Mark's lens, his hermeneutic. He's saying this is 
the heart of the gospel message to love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what do you think of that answer? Is it sufficient for you? Is that a good enough answer to what's the heart of the gospel message? Is there anything missing out of that answer? It's been pointed out that there is inherent within what he's saying here a sense of relationship, right? We're to be in relationship, loving relationship with God. We're being, to be in loving relationship with each other. That that's inherent within his answer about what's the heart of the gospel message. And apparently the scribe likes his answer because he basically repeats it back to him. He says, good answer. Good answer, Rabbi. And Jesus says to him, because you have said this, you have come close to the kingdom of God. Now, note he doesn't say you are now in the kingdom of God, but he says you've come close to that kingdom of God that exists right now in the midst of us. So implied here is that knowing these things, knowing we're supposed to love God, we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves, that's important, but that just gets you to the edge of the kingdom. What gets you into the kingdom of God? Is living that out in relationship with each other. How do you love God? The answer seems pretty clear. We love each other. We love the the stranger. We love the neighbor. That's how we live it out. That's how we live out the hermeneutic that we're given. Now, let's be honest. This is Mark's hermeneutic. Maybe it's Jesus's. We can't be for certain, but we know it goes at least back to Mark and his community. They're saying this is the heart of the gospel message. But if you read other gospel texts, you'd get a different hermeneutic. And let's be really honest today, this is Brian's hermeneutic. I got to pick out the scripture text that we use today to answer the question, what's the heart of the gospel message, right? So again, I'm imposing my lenses upon you, my hermeneutic. I could just as easily have picked a different text. How about this one from Luke? Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into glory? Some people read the gospel through that lens. Or how about this one from Paul in 1 Corinthians? Now I should remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Certainly there are many Christians that read the question, what's the heart of the gospel message, through that lens, through that hermeneutic. But again, I'm interested today in hearing what your hermeneutic is. So I have another question for you. If a non-Christian came to you today, wherever you are in your faith journey today, and said to you, tell me about this faith that you're part of, what is at the heart of it, what's the basic thing that you would want people to know, what's the heart of the message of the good news that you say you have, what would you tell that person? So I want to invite you right now to pull out the insert that hopefully you have in your bulletin. And on the back of one of those inserts is a little cloud. And there are a lot of words on that cloud and phrases. And I want to invite you to take a minute, grab something to write with, if you would, and um, look for words there that speak to how you might answer this question. What is the heart of the gospel message today? If you were going to tell somebody that. Maybe take a minute and circle the ones that you respond to. You think, yeah, that would probably be in my answer. There might be ones on there that you don't like. You'd say, no way would I say that to somebody. Cross those out. If I've missed something, take a moment. Maybe there's a word or a phrase in there you think needs to be in there. Add that in. So just take a minute to do that. Nobody told you you're going to have to work when you came to worship today, did they? <laughs> Anybody want to toss out? Is there a word or a phrase that you particularly like that you'd say, yeah, I would include that in my answer? God's grace. God's grace. 
What's that? Transformation. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Freedom. Freedom. Love. Love. Anything you would not include in your answer? Going to heaven, escaping hell. Okay, we, going to heaven, escaping hell, which we don't, we don't talk about a whole lot in this congregation anyway, but it is part of some of our hermeneutics. What's that? Atonement. All right. Being saved. Um, so we're already seeing we all have kind of a different way of coming at this. We would maybe talk about it in different ways. What I'm suggesting to us this morning, though, it's important that we would be able to answer this question if somebody asked us. What is the good news that you have to give me from Jesus? What does it sound like? Maybe even what does it look like? So we mentioned we're in the midst this, this month of a generosity focused. What does it mean to be generous? And we're absolutely talking about being generous with the resources that keep these lights on and the cool air or the heat going throughout the year and maintaining this building for all the people that come in here and do ministry in and out of this building. But I also want to suggest we need to be generous in other ways. And one way we can be generous is in sharing our story. Generous in being able to share the story of the faith we have and the grace and love of Jesus Christ with other people Not just sharing it with one another here, but how do we take it out of here and share it with other people? Now, a couple of Sundays ago, I asked you to try to drop Jesus' name into a conversation. A couple of you shared with me that you tried to do that with some interesting results. I actually had a conversation with an atheist yesterday where I just said, what do you think of Jesus? And I learned a lot by talking to him about it. This time, I want to suggest that somehow in the next week or two, try to work what you understand to be the heart of the gospel message into your conversation with somebody. You don't need to say, in church we talked about, you just might say, what do you think about this idea? And see where the conversation takes you. Think about being generous with the story that you have to share of the grace and love of God. Many years ago, Karl Barth, who was a very famous 20th century theologian, he wrote all these very scholarly theological texts, was asked during a Q&A session after a lecture, could you sum up your understanding of your theology in just a statement, just a phrase? Sort of the person was saying, what what is your lens of seeing the gospel? What's your hermeneutic? And Karl Barth, he, he paused and he thought a minute, and then he said, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. All the rest is commentary. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we come to you wearing the lenses of our lives, each seeing you in different ways. We acknowledge those lenses this morning as a gift from you and as a gift that we're called to share with each other and with the world as we tell them of the good news of your love and your grace through Christ our Lord. Amen.